Hey, welcome back, everybody. We're here with our second ever episode of the Collect Cash podcast. And I'm flattered here. I have a, a guest that I've been talking to for a really long time. He's a great friend of mine. Uh, we have Ryan Giffen in the house. Thanks for having me, Cody. Yeah, Ryan, I've known you for about two years now. And, you know, I've always wanted to just sit down and talk with you and pick at your brain. And uh, yet we get opportunity here today to do that. Uh, so yeah, just uh, give us a quick intro of yourself. I know that you, you're you about 32, you live in South Florida and you know, you're invested in you know stock market, real estate, crypto, all that. Yeah, yeah, so my name's Ryan. Um, I am, you're 32, you're right here in South Florida. Uh, I've been into investing ever since I had a little bit more money than I could to pay my bills. I, I knew I had to do something with it. Uh, a lot of my investing DNA comes from coming out of the, the financial crisis which I was in college in you know, 2008, 2011, pretty much the worst of it when the sky was falling. And uh, I just had this reaction to say like, I really should understand how this money game works because a lot of people are getting destroyed. <laughs> and, uh, and a lot of my, my ethos into investing is a lot of to deal with like moving away from that pain, which, which I've talked about a few times on the channel. But um, so, so everyone may have like, everyone may have a little bit different investing reason why they're into it or that, but so, for me, it was a very pain-driven thing, and and I've picked out a number of asset classes that I like, and so far, it's uh, it's worked out pretty well. So, Ryan, did like your family get you into stock market investing? Like, did they kind of teach you the ropes, or was this something that you took the initiative to learn? Uh, no, no, I'm now getting my family to invest into the market. <laughs> <laughs> so they uh, they did not invest in the markets, but they've been following my moves, and they're they're pretty big fans of it now. Um, my, my grandfather, though, was uh, big into investing in real estate. So coming out of the financial crisis, like I was kind of first wanted to get into like, I was kind of scared of the stock market, too. I, I kind of started following people like Peter Schiff, and not like the, the best um, eyes on the market, in my opinion. And then uh, I, I, my grandfather, who came from Cuba during the communist revolution, 1960, came here in his like early 40s with like you know, just pennies in his pocket and then retired in 10 to 15 years around there doing real estate investing. So I was like, this is what I should be doing with my money. <laughs> so, um, so once I could save up a decent enough chunk to get a down payment, I bought another home and then bought another home. And uh, that was uh, outside of gold and silver and some other investments into like retirement funds. That was my you know, first major investment. So would you say you started investing around the age of like 22, right? When you were done with college, right? When the, you know, the 08 recession was coming to an end or? Uh, yeah, I, I kind of took the detour in college. I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I kind of hung around. So it's probably a little bit later than that, maybe more like 23, 24. I, you know, I started in a selling for a company now that I have, a, have some ownership in and I've built other companies with uh, my partner there. and. Um, and when we rolled out uh, a way for employees to invest into the 401k with a match, I mean, that sounded like a no brainer. And still there's employees in the company that do not take advantage of free money, uh, which it's, it's insane to me, but. <laughs> <laughs> Are you, uh, do you ever like actually have conversations with those people about like why they're not, uh, you know, getting that full match or is that kind of uh, go against what you can do as an employer? <laughs> uh I am, I evangelize everyone into investing. It's very hard to sit around with me and not end up talking about investing. <laughs> I, feel that, I feel like I can be kind of exhausting or, you know, I kind of want to get, find other things to really be passionate about. But, you, you know, once you get that investing bug in you and you, know, you have such a strong goal for financial freedom, which is essentially what it's all about for me, it's, uh, it, it, it lives inside of me every day. Yeah, that's, I mean, I've seen your portfolio just continue to go up and up over these past couple of years. So I know you, uh, I think at one point you used to have Robinhood um, and now you're on Webull. And uh, can you talk about some of what your best and worst stock investments were? Uh, I, I'm, I'm unfortunately pretty, uh, still a lot into Robinhood. And a lot of that was because I wanted to be on it for probably a lot of the reasons you were on it. One, it has a great user interface and it's very beginner friendly. So one, when I was kind of beginning, it was very useful. And then also having a channel, it attracted the, the, the people that'd be interested in my channel, newer investors. And uh, also, I mean, the Robinhood portfolio, I, last year when 
everything bottomed. You know, I was putting like everything I really could, even though like my business was down, I wasn't making any money, but like whatever I could put over there, you know, and I got like $5,000 extra into Ethereum at like $161. And that's turned into $120,000 now in that oh account. My gosh. So, so I can't even, and with Bitcoin Cash, so I bought like, yeah, I put a lot more than that recently. Um, but like, so just that portfolio that today hit $325,000 in just that account. Um, wow. I also have, uh, it's insane the, the <laughs> amount of returns. It, it's appreciated by over $225,000 since I started it. Um, you are just dominating it, the market, Ryan. Giving well, us that <laughs> knowledge. <laughs> so, so, but to answer your question, Ethereum has definitely been my best uh, returned asset. Mm -hmm. um, Tesla, I definitely... Uh, did very well on. I, I was in that crowd before, you know, when when people still kind of hated it, you know. Right. Everybody on CNBC, but now now these days, everybody on CNBC claims that they were with them <laughs> since day one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now the stock is uh, gonna gonna go sideways for five years probably. Yeah. Um, and and that's and that's so those two are kind of my best, and I learned a lot about investing into like the emotions, um, really in the first crypto run. You know, I made a lot of mistakes and, and a lot of people took that away and like they abandoned the asset after like it pumped up and then went down. And, um, and that, that to me, it was like, wow, like I can't wait to the next cycle. Like when it was over and I had to wait all those years to be able to get into cryptos like that. Um, so, so while crypto was probably in my learning curve was my worst investment, but by far now it's, um, and also I have a Voyager portfolio that's um that's done extremely well where you can buy some smaller projects. Uh, I use Merrill Ledge and Fidelity as well. Okay, so you're just like all over the place on different brokerages, and you'd like to try them out. Well, there's different ones that serve different things. Yeah. Uh, so like Merrill Ledge, I use my IR, my tax sheltered accounts, my IRAs, all that. And I just buy ETFs in them. Uh, and then Fidelity, I I'll, I'll probably end up moving a lot of funds over there mm -hmm. after this crypto bull cycle. I'm kind of stuck in my crypto and uh, Robinhood because you don't really own it. And you have to sell it to realize the gains. Right. And I don't want to do that until, you know, I, I have a thesis of the market going, you know, probably seven, eight trillion at the top. And I, I, we may jump into reasons why the crypto market is, pr is pretty easy to understand what it's going to do. Mm -hmm. It just does the same thing over and over again every four years. Um, but I, I have, I have my, in my entry strategy and I have my exit strategy. So, but I'll, I'll use more fidelity. Uh, I own some OTC stocks over there that are harder to get on other platforms. So that's useful for that. Uh, but that's the reason I use those portfolios. My Weeble one, I only really used to, um, they had that really attractive sign up bonus for YouTube. Right. One of my videos went like viral, got like somewhat viral, viral for me. I got like 20,000 views. So yeah. I was making like six, 700 bucks a month from people just watching this tutorial on how to get free stocks. Wow. Hey, it's pays for itself right there. <laughs> yeah. And Ryan, what did you say that your uh, worst investment ever was? It was crypto. Was crypto. I, um, I got so frustrated with, um, you know, investing into like commodities and, and things with poor investments. And, you know, I eventually took the red pill on crypto. I was like, this makes sense. And even though I'm buying at these ridiculously high prices, I uh, like I'm, I'm willing to ride the wave for many years. But what I actually ended up doing, I ended up losing so much money where I sold it for the loss. And, and tax sheltered, you know, took the, the, the loss and I waited the amount of time and I bought back at like the bottom and then that's worked out pretty well. So I got a tax break and then, so that's been my worst investment was crypto and my best investment in crypto. <laughs> yeah, I guess, <laughs> uh, I guess for most investors, when they, when they even just hear cryptocurrency, they're really just thinking about like Bitcoin and now Ethereum. And I, I'm sure that you've, you're involved in like several different uh, cryptocurrencies other than those two maybe mainstream ones um i, I try to keep it tight yeah uh, I, I i think uh even with you you could probably relate when your portfolio gets too big it becomes a little bit more difficult to manage unless you have specific strategies for certain things mm -hmm. um but uh I, I own probably about seven or eight coins okay. and uh so, so, I mean, that sounds like a lot, but some people own 20. I mean, there's over 8,000 coins out there to pick. <laughs> from. So, uh, but I, I'm sticking with um, uh, coins, but mainly of those seven or eight, like 90% are in three of them, of, okay, of the gotcha. capital. Yeah. And then the, the other ones are 10% spread into some smaller plays just to mess around with.
and dogecoin is the the largest holding right <laughs> man i can't get into that and I, I and i i sound so wrong because i have been talking against it for so long and um but you know it's it's so fascinating that people are not investing in anything or their first crypto they pick is a meme coin and <laughs> it just really and they, they think they're investors and it's and they get mad at you when you when you like I, I tell people like I'm so happy you made money with it. You should take some of those profits and put it into something like, you know, blue chip. You know, you know, <laughs> uh, you know how I know like anybody is literally getting into it. Ryan is that you know the people that like I went to high school with that aren't doing much with their lives. They're the ones that they never talk about any like investing related stuff on like Facebook or social media, but lately they've just been typing like Dogecoin to $1, you know, exclamation mark. And I'm like, wow, when these guys are talking about it, that's how you, that's how you know to sell. <laughs> but Cody, it's actually like a $70 billion asset now. It's crazy. It's worth more than Ford and Twitter combined. Like, like really, you know, like, like great companies, of, you know, it's, it, it's insane what humans can do in terms of, I, I can't wrap my head around it. I know Elon Musk has a lot to do with it and, and he, he's just having fun with it in terms of um, joking. Then he goes on, did you watch the SNL with, with him on there? I saw a few clips of it, yeah. His like opening and... So so obviously it was buy the rumors, sell the news with SNL, right? Yeah. The thing was pumping up to like 75 cents. And then he says that joke about how it's a hustle and then it goes all the way down to 45 cents. And people are literally tweeting at him like, I lost everything because of you. So like, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, no. That's why we put every disclaimer in every video we make. This right. Is not Do your own research because you, like, if you really think he's going to go out there on SNL, a joke show, and right. then say how he's like converted all his assets to it. And now Tesla only accepts Dogecoin. Like, right. man, like it just really makes me down on humanity. It's funny because like they could have just put that money in like an index fund or something and gotten great returns over, you know, the bulk of their life, but they got to get that get rich scheme in there. Have you seen Ryan uh, Andre Jeek? He did uh, like an interview with a person who made over a million dollars with Dogecoin. Uh, he basically was not an investor, I think, prior to that. And like overnight, he became a millionaire. And now he's on a couple of different, you know, financial channels. I, I see the thumbnail in my head, but I got to tell you, I've avoided the doge thing like like the play. <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, the big takeaway there was that like he was with Andre and he was with Graham. I think I think he made a million and then he doubled that to like two million the next day. And then Andre and Graham were like, dude, you just got to sell this. Like you you've already like won the system here. You've like hit the lottery. Just sell it. Move on with life. You can you can buy a Tesla. You, I think he lived in like a really small single studio. They're like, dude, you can buy whatever you want now. And I think he held on to it. And uh, I don't know, he's probably lost some money now. I don't know if he sold it, but I don't know. I guess it's kind of that emotion thing you were talking about when you have, when you've made so much money, you kind of get greedy. You're like, okay, now that I made 2 million, can I make 3 million? Like rather than just pull it out, take your profits. Yeah, I, I have friends that have, that, that have both, both their crypto portfolios are, you know, really good returns they had more money than me going into it but they're both sitting about you know 2.5 to 3 million in, in crypto and uh and we keep on talking about like when is the time to take profit and i haven't taken any profit either so take that for what it's worth i only have you know in relation to about two hundred thousand or so into crypto right now um but you know but i turned like thirty thousand into that so it's still like an amazing return within like a year and a half and uh but like, there's, there's really, but like, you have to have a reason to believe and strong conviction. It's going to go much higher and not take any profit yet. And you and, and understand the risk versus reward in Dogecoin. I just, I don't understand the, the, like the upside is like someone really has to do something with it to give it utility. And, and I'm not sure. I, I know you recently bought into crypto too, and how you value these assets and justify their market caps. Uh, whether it's a trillion dollar Bitcoin or $350 billion Ethereum, like there has to be a thesis to say this deserves this much market share. Right. And, uh, and to, for me, that's very difficult to do with Doge at 70 billion. Yeah. And you know, Ryan, that's the thing too, is that I feel like every day there's just a new cryptocurrency coming out and I'm like, uh, you know, what's the difference between this and the other one? And, uh, 
Yeah. So I bought in to Coinbase or I'm in, I'm on the Coinbase app now. So I was able to buy for the first time I bought into Bitcoin and then I bought into Ethereum, which I feel like are the two more mainstream ones that most people have now heard about. So today was actually the first day that Ethereum cracked over $4,000. So do you think it's going to kind of ride that same trend as Bitcoin? Uh, absolutely. And it has a couple of large events coming up for it. And probably a lot of the price is getting taken into there. Um, they're going to change the um, they're going to they're going to change the way the system operates from being a proof of work to proof of stake, which pretty much means that, you know, where proof of work is when everyone talks about cryptocurrency taking up all this energy because all these computers are competing to solve these, all these algorithms and it literally uses like more energy than all of Argentina for to, you know, secure the Bitcoin network or proof of stake just people, you know, commit their money to it and it uses like 99% less energy. So anyways, they're going to like have to burn a bunch of coins to do this. And like, it's going to be like a massive takeover um, to, to rewrite the system. So that's like going to be the most euphoric moment of the Ethereum run. And then the thing's going to crash by 90%. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and Bitcoin will probably fall by, by about 75, 80% from its top. And all I'm, and, and let me kind of preface that a little bit. So how did that, like, where, where am I picking my, my sell targets and where did I pick my buy targets? So when you buy Bitcoin, you really want to look at, or the, any cryptocurrency, you want to look at relationship to the halving cycle. So Bitcoin has its mineable supply every four years. The next event will be in 2024. The best chance for you to retire in 2026 is to go all in in cryptocurrency in 2024, in my opinion. And this is just what happens. So even if demand just stays constant in Bitcoin, when the mineable supply halves, the price just goes parabolic because Satoshi Nakamoto wrote this into the code. And I think it was almost genius. They created a mania, created so many overnight millionaires, rather than just letting the, the, the currency slowly get inflated by 1% a day, you, would, you wouldn't have like this all of a sudden mania of the price going up and people chasing it and over romanticizing the investment and making it way overvalued than what it should be at that current time. So right. it's part of the genius right. and the coding of Bitcoin. Yeah, that's just crazy. You know, like they say that like the, right, there's a max of 21 million Bitcoin. I think the last one, the Bitcoin that can be mined comes out like in the year 2100s. Uh, so it does Ethereum, does, does it follow that same scarcity principle? Like, is there only X amount of Ethereum out there that will always be out there? No, no. Um, it's, it's very different. And people criticize Ethereum for uh, being almost centralized in a way to, because there could be more, there could be less. They're changing the code, they're, they're doing this. And it has a very uh, prominent figurehead, Vitalik Buterin. So it's almost like what makes Bitcoin beautiful, or I'm a big fan of Bitcoin Cash, we'll probably touch on that. But it, I will say this is beautiful up about Bitcoin. There is no central point of attack. There is no one to go after, to throw in a cage, to, 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 to shut it down. To, it, it's very difficult. There's no one person behind it where Ethereum kind of has that. They have a a genius mind behind it that, that created something very unique in terms of smart contracts. And, and but what, for me, what makes it decentralized in a way though is so much good talent is always building something on it, you know? And unfortunately uh, in cryptocurrency, one of the biggest innovations for Ethereum was the ERC20 token where you could launch new cryptos off of it. It became much easier to create other projects. Um, and, uh, and there's some people joke, Ethereum's a great Ponzi scheme to launch other Ponzi screens. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, there's a little bit of truth to that because a lot of crypto is uh, vaporware and uh, not going anywhere. So it really does seem like Ethereum, like you can actually make it part of a programming language. Uh, it could be used in smart contracts. And like you were talking about, you know, different applications can actually be built around it. It's not, it's kind of like, you know, people, one of the critiques people have of gold is that, you know, it's not really useful for anything. I, I mean, it's, it's nice and shiny to look at and to touch, but like, you know, you can't power your car with gold as far as I know. So is that kind of what allures you think investors into Ethereum is that it has all these possible uses that we haven't even touched the surface on yet? That and, and the talents there, you know, and, and when people don't take crypto seriously and they, they see that now it's a $2 trillion asset, but like, there's so much intellectual capital that is in the cryptocurrency market and so much of it is in Ethereum that is, is building the future world. And the biggest issue has been the scaling issue. You know, that's why for me, I, Ethereum's over, 
overvalued right now. It is not worth, it does not deserve a higher market value than PayPal, in my opinion. The fees mm -hmm. are way too high. Uh, and hopefully the rewriting of the software works and we can do something great in a decentralized way in terms of exchanging, exchanging value or exchanging contracts with another. Um, but this is, this is what happens in crypto cycles. It, we, we become massively overvalued. Um, but the, the thing, you can't just, in terms of the stock market, you probably relate, you can't really, you have to find a way to know how overvalued an asset become. Like how, can, how long can you hold it past the, the, the trend line? And what I mean by that, I should say, on, on my channel, I, I use something called the Trollo chart that I, I look at the volatility in the crypto market and I draw a line right through it. And I say, this is the median value. And it kind of goes up and to the right smoothly, but it makes lows against the trend. And then we make highs above the trend. And that's where I make my decisions. Right now, like in the, in the last cycle, we went uh, seven, sorry, 1500% past the trend line. And the previous cycle of that, we went 2,500% past the trend line. So this time I'm saying we're modestly gonna go 700% past the trend line, which makes it a $7 trillion market. And by that time, I will have very little crypto. So Ryan, uh, I, I'm sure you've heard of this. There's always this infamous story of uh, Microsoft during the dot-com bubble. Uh, from 1999 to 2016, Microsoft in 1999 reached an all-time high, and then it would be 17 years before it ever reached that all-time high again. So do you think those highs and lows between those trend lines, you think it will ever take 17 years, or you think it will probably be a lot shorter than that? It'll be four years. Four years. And all in relationship to the Bitcoin halving cycle. It's a rather, and look, this is not financial advice, take it with a grain of salt, do your own research, all that stuff. But this is what it does. This is what it's done over and over again in relationship to the, the halving cycle. So I don't think you'll have to wait that long. And I think what made that unique in terms of Microsoft, uh, that it had two things going for it. One, it was massively overvalued in, in the dot-com bubble, but then it also was followed by a, a 10 year stock market, bear market and a commodity bull market. So again, one of my other big things that I, you know, use as an investment tool is the inverse relationship between stocks and commodities, right? And if you look at throughout history, stocks tend to run on these bull runs for 20 plus years, and then they get interrupted by a 10 year um, commodity cycle. And it's, it's very healthy, you know, when, when commodities are, are very cheap, which they're relatively cheap right now, and I think they need to get cheaper, um, is that it leaves more speculative money for investors to not have to spend things into commodities to, to operate the economy, but they can actually speculate with it. And you get these industries that blow up like dot-com bubbles and crypto markets. And right now it's, it's prime for crypto and stocks in my opinion. You know, Ryan, I think, I'm, I think I'm following you on that every four years of like a boom or bust cycle, because for me, the first time I ever heard of cryptocurrency was uh, when I was a senior in college, that would have been about uh, 2017, uh, that was probably the first time a lot of people actually had ever heard of Bitcoin because it had went from like $3,000 to $20,000 within a span of a few weeks. And then it, it, it just absolutely tanked and it didn't do so hot for X amount of years. And then I feel like right when uh, C19 started, that's when it started rising again. And then as of today, I think it's at like $57,000. So uh, that was personally the first time I had ever heard of cryptocurrency. I was kind of wondering when was the first time you had heard of it and were you, was this something that you were instantly hooked on or was this something that you had to kind of, you know, sit down and really process what you're looking at here? Uh, first time I heard about cryptocurrency was in 2000, probably 2012, 2011, 2012, right around there. I was in college and the kid that sat next to me used to use the Silk Road to buy like hallucinogenic drugs. And <laughs> And that's the first time I heard about it. And then I was also, I used to listen to like different libertarian shows and, you know, Ron Paul was running for president at the time. So, that, you know, that was just a thing on college campus. And, um, and I liked it. Didn't really understand how to buy it at the time. It wasn't as easy as now. There wasn't these big brokerages, like, like early investors, like literally had to call someone up and like wire some money and get this key address. Like the whole infrastructure wasn't quite ready. And me as a young kid, not really knowing to invest, I'm I, I not having much money to invest. I wasn't that interested. But then in 2013, when the bull market happened, when it went from like nothing to a thousand, again, following that four-year trend, 2013, 2017, 2021, next one will be 2025. 
And, and it's all in relationship to when Bitcoin halves. So Bitcoin halved last year, it's, it's my level supply, and then it ran. But I heard about it then, and I unfortunately did not get, gather up the courage to really buy it until, I think, I think the first crypto I did buy it was Ethereum in sometime in early 2017. Uh, I listened to Peter Schiff for years because I, I liked his economic mind and just the overall economy. Like he wrote a great book called uh, How an Economy Grows and Why, Why It Crashes. It's a fantastic book. It, it really explains the economic system in a very organic, primal, simple way. And, uh, and it really helped me understand the world. Uh, but he is still not interested in investing in crypto, even though he's watched it go from nothing to 60,000. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Peter Schiff, but he's like the loudest person against it and like trolls people on, on Twitter about it. You know, Peter? Yeah, I used to watch his videos when he would like be interviewing people in New York during that like Occupy Wall Street protest. I've seen a few of his interviews. I think right now he lives in like Puerto Rico to avoid paying like certain taxes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, that was great. You don't have to pay any income, uh, sorry, any capital gains tax and only a 4% corporate tax. And, and it's like beautiful weather year round, I assume. I haven't been, but uh, uh, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, so Peter, Peter's not the only one that's been a bear about crypto. So if you remember, I think right before C19 happened, I put out a video. It's still up on my channel. And it was talking about why I thought Bitcoin was a uh, basically a pyramid scheme, Ponzi scheme. And I think, you know, the reason why I kept that video on there is to prove that, you know, people's opinions they change from time to time. If you constantly always have the same opinion and you're not willing to learn and you're not willing to change your opinion based on new information you gather, you're not really growing as a person. You're not really growing as an investor. So, you know, I, I, I still have that video up. I still think I brought up some valid points in that video, but one of the bigger points that I talked about in that video that I no longer feel is valid anymore. And this is a big uh, reason why people don't like cryptocurrency is they thought basically that the U.S. government at any time could say, hey, <laughs> cryptocurrency is illegal now, P price of Bitcoin falls to zero. Now, the reason why I think that that will no longer happen is because, you know, there's three countries, right? Russia, China, United States. If the United States bans <laughs> cryptocurrency, Russia and China are going to be like, hey, come on over here, investors. We got, we'll allow cryptocurrency to bring your money into our countries. So do you feel the same way? And I'm sure you have other reasons to why the U.S. government probably is not going to be banning cryptocurrency. Yeah, I made a whole video about that. And uh, definitely part of that, that, that's a big part of it. Um, and, and the United States has been relatively friendly towards it. And what I talked about earlier is earlier, there's, there's a lot of intellectual capital in this industry. So if you want to push out all these really smart people that are, are going to build some of the innovative things that are going to operate the economy in the future, you don't want to kick those people out. You know, the United States is so powerful because we almost do brain drain on other nations. We take their best talent. So like anyone in the Caribbean or South America, anyone that wants a better life and give their best to this economy, we're very attractive to that. And we, we pull in the most talented people and we have places like Silicon Valley that bloom the, the, the tech revolution. And uh, absolutely. So that would be a, that would be uncompetitive on, on the global scale and, and could um, hinder your hegemonic power in, in the world for sure. Yeah, definitely. And then also like, if you want to shut it down, like it's also a, a very big task and you have to cooperate with all these countries because what keeps Bitcoin or in these proof of work concepts going is that you have miners all over the world running a node. So it's just an open software. And as long as there's one computer keeping it open, then you can't shut it down. There's not, again, there's over 10,000 nodes on the Bitcoin network. So that's, the, and they're all over the world. So you're going to go to 10,000 places and, sh and shut them all down. Another one's going to pop up here. It's nearly impossible. I mean, it's kind of like the same argument against like, okay, let's ban drugs. Let's ban guns, right? You, there's just so much of it going around. You're never really going to ban all that. I feel like. You know, yeah, I use that. I use that as an analogy. It's like, and even like in, during the 1930s, they made owning gold illegal. Like they they really did that. And, and but some people still owned it. But that for the, the Federal issue, Reserve, right? <laughs> yeah, they, there was the Gold Compensation Act of 1933 by uh, by Roosevelt, and gold was not not actually legal to own until 19 after after they delinked the dollar from gold because the reason they they wanted to take uh, they wanted to take everyone's gold is to get rid of the free market in it. 
And this way you could almost have a gold standard but lie about it. So they said one ounce of gold is worth $25 and they price fixed it. So there was no market, the market wasn't pricing it. It was just, the government said this. And then after the dealing with the dollar from gold, it went from $25 all the way up to 800 in just like a couple of years because how badly they mispriced it by price fixing it. Yeah, that's another part about crypto that I really like is that it's, you know, it's decentralized finance. So it's removing that power that governments have had for so long. And, you know, we talk, we talk about all the corruption that happens here in the United States of America. You know, think about other countries that are going through like massive inflation. You have, you know, Venezuela today where the currency is basically useless. Uh, there's been parts of Africa that have widespread inflation. Having an asset like crypto where, you know, a government, perhaps it's a dictator government that's in charge, they can't just, you know, inflate the money and make pe uh, people's livelihood basically worthless. Uh, I think that's a big reason why a lot of people are bullish on cryptocurrency is that it's really giving power back to the people. Yeah. And, and when you explain it that way, it's like so humanitarian because the other argument you'll hear is that like, you know, kidnappers and, or sorry, uh, drug dealers and, and what, what did uh, Charlie Munger say during, I can't remember, he's money launderers and he, he didn't promote a, 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 a currency or something like that that could make it so easy. And uh, I put up a, uh, a thing on Twitter and I thought it was pretty funny because the last time they talked about crypto during the bull market, Warren Buffett said Bitcoin was rat poison. And there's this funny <laughs> meme going around the internet now where it says Bitcoin is rat poison, Warren Buffett. And then below it has pictures of rats with all bank logos on it yeah. that, that, he yeah. own, that he owns. And, and I just commented like, yeah, Bitcoin is rat poison, but the rats are the, uh, but the, the rats are the banks that Warren Buffett owns. Right. Yeah. Buffett loves those big banks, but yeah. And you know what, I think what else, what else you added in that post was uh, you pointed out that Berkshire Hathaway has actually uh, trailed the market for like the last 20 years, which a lot of people, they never mentioned that part about uh, Berkshire Hathaway. And, uh, and I like Buffett and I think he mean he's done a lot of good and, and you know, I can pick out those 20 years where he's underperformed and you can really say it's because he's really not paid attention to tech. And tech yeah. is just dominated for 20 years. Right. And, uh, but oh, since 1960, he's, he's crushed the market. So I, he definitely deserves his respect, but he also, anyone you should be able to criticize and um, an asset class that I like so much, I'll, I'll put, I don't like hate Buffett per se, but uh, I don't, you don't want to just blindly follow everyone, you know? Right. Yeah. And no, even like he owns such a substantial part of Apple, but he got into Amazon really late. I don't think he ever got into Google. Like he, like you said, he missed out on a lot of these tech companies. And yeah, he really is in love with the banks. Uh, and, you know, another investor that's getting a lot of flack right now because her, her fund isn't doing that hot after a, you know, super hot 2020 is Kathy Wood. You know, my ARC shares are down pretty heavy right now. And a lot of people, it's amazing. You know, do you just go into the comment sections? People are like, you know, we hate you, Kathy. Like you stole our money. Uh, <laughs> like, oh my God. That's what I just don't understand. You know, I have maybe, I think ARC makes up about like two to 3% of my portfolio. So even if Kathy does great next year, you know, or great or bad next year, it's not going to impact my portfolio that much. But I think some people, they're just like, hey, Let's give all my money to Kathy, let her do whatever she wants. And I'm only expecting good things to happen. And now we're in here in 2021, spring of 2021, ARC, ARC is actually trailing the market. I think they actually have a negative return, even though the market is, is up like 7%. So what, what are your thoughts on Kathy? And obviously she had a great 2020, but you got to back it up now, 2021. So I, I think people should look at her as a legendary investor, because I think she is. And they should go look at another legendary investor, uh, Peter Lynch and the Magellan Fund. So I'll tell a quick story here. Peter Lynch returned 39% annually for, I think it was a good, maybe 15 year run of the Magellan Fund. He got that return, but guess what? His investors only made about seven, 8% because most people are bad investors. When they see, when they saw him underperforming, they pulled out. And when they saw him doing really well, they bought. And, uh, and if everyone just realized like investing is just the inverse of that, <laughs> that uh, today's winners are not going to be necessarily tomorrow's winners and today's losers could be tomorrow's winners. So 
I think uh, I think the pe most people are just bad investors. Uh, I actually today actually I have, I might eat in my retirement fund I bought some RK. I think it could, it's going to go down to about in the, in the 80s. I could see that happening. I see yeah. some resistance in the low 90s and again at 83. Uh, I'm just waiting to acquire more. You know, I it depends on what your investing horizon is and how like in my Robinhood portfolio I have over a 205 percent return that, you know in one year. So I'm asking myself how can I get anywhere near these good kind of returns next year? It, it's not by chasing what's hot right now. It's, right. it's about finding, you know, what is not love, what is overlooked. So I'm, I'm even going into SPACs right now because they're getting so beat up and arc. I just want, I want to see it go lower. So I think, um, I think if people think there's these comment, these people in the comment section, I doubt have anywhere than the amount of intellectual capacity of <laughs> Kathy Woods, she's very intelligent. You know what, you know, what also surprises me too, and this could be the hot and cold cycles of the market is that, you know, in January sentiment toward Kathy Woods was probably at like all time high. Everybody loved her, but you know, four months later, now all of a sudden Kathy is a total idiot and people hate her. Like <laughs> if you think about it, not much has really changed in four months, right? Like their largest holding is still Tesla. Tesla is still a great company, right? Just the market just doesn't love it as much as it did a few months ago you know, companies, they don't drastically change in just four months. And, you know, stock prices in the short term, they don't make sense. But in the long run, they will eventually start to show their true value. So, you know, Kathy and Arc might be down today. But it also if you if you average even the two years, right? So I'm not sure what Arc's return last year was, let's say it was like, a you know, 80% or something. And it's 0% this year, if you take the average of those two years, that's still 40%, which is, you know, that destroys the market returns. So I, th I, th I think it was a little ludicrous that people would think that Kathy and Ark would be able to keep up that staggering pace of being in the top 1% in total ETF returns uh, every single year. That That's just, you're not even the greatest investors can do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, you, you have to, you know, I don't expect her to become completely contrarian in her fund to chase every year and, and and for some reason dump all of her you know uh you know what, what innovative investments and then going into consumer non-cyclical because that would do better now like i don't see kathy dumping tesla from procter and gamble it's just not going to happen <laughs> she's playing a five-year trend 10-year trend if you will and uh and, and and she's still putting out these huge numbers for tesla and, and i do think tesla will for example being her largest holding I'm using this as an example but like it, 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 it probably will do really well over five years, but it may do nothing for the next four. Like it, it has so much future price into it um, that that needs to, you know, the market will price it. But, but eventually you have to ask yourself, what is the future going to look like? And, and is Tesla a large player in that? And I'm just using that as an example because uh, she has a lot of different holdings. But yeah, um, I, I I think people uh, people just need to look at investing and try to, you know, when you're euphoric, you know, probably take, especially in growth investing, like I know you do a lot of dividend investing and you've been getting more into growth, but like it's good to shave a little off the top when things just run a little silly. Yeah. Um, and then put those into something else that is either really hated or something that is a little bit more stable, like a dividend growth company. In my, in my opinion, just, just doing this for a little while. Um, and, and growth investing is just a different animal. It's gonna be, you're not going to get the large swings up if you're not going to get the large swings down. The market doesn't work that way. Volatility is where, where the opportunity is. Oh, I mean, people say that like you can't get rich off dividend stocks, and that's so far from the truth. Like I bought like into Honeywell. Me and you both own Applied Materials. Those stocks have just been tearing up the market. <laughs> Uh, Disney even, uh, I know they recently stopped paying a dividend, but Disney has been doing really great this past year. There's some of the, a lot of these blue chip companies, like people always think you need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, you can get great results with these large blue chip companies that also pay dividends. Uh, it's best of both worlds, in my opinion. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I, it's funny. I mentioned, I actually had bought Procter Gamble for the first time today. <laughs> really? <laughs> you're, you're like, I just felt like it was, it, it was, it, it's a little bit down from where it peaked in the pandemic and I've always wanted to get it. Uh, and I really want to build out like a nice dividend portfolio. And I feel like that's, that's just like a staple for any great dividend portfolio. It, it's really hard to go to like Walmart and not 
see a Procter and Gamble product, like even if it doesn't yeah. explicitly say it, like if you look on the fine print, it'll have the little PG logo. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think if you you know if you look at the market, you look at how many tools it gives you, and and just try to be a little contrarian with it, and um, you know I, I think you you know it can treat you very well, and I think you can make lots of money and. Um, yeah, that's uh, uh, why it's hard to be around me and not talk about investing because it's just so <laughs> exciting. <laughs> so Ryan, what was the inspiration for you to start your channel? A few things, a few things. One, uh, I really thought I could become a better investor if I was teaching the material and found a community of people that wanted to talk about it with me. And I can definitely say there's correlation between that. I've become a better investor since doing it. Uh, I wanted to... I mean, that was that was probably the biggest reason. You know, I went to college to become a teacher, and that was like the biggest thing they talked about. Like the best way to have your students learn something was to have them teach it to someone else. So, and anyone that listens to this, like I challenge you to uh, to take something if you want to be great at something and show mastery of it, get to the level where you can teach someone else. It doesn't have to be investing; it can be anything. You know, it could be basketball, it could be swimming, it could be you know fixing cars, it, it, whatever it is. Uh, so that was the biggest reason. And then second, obviously I, I pick YouTube or I kind of got an inkling to do it because my, my wife is a YouTuber. She's a very successful YouTuber. And uh, do, do you want to yeah. plug her name in here so that viewers can also check out her channel too, if they're interested? Sure, sure. Her name's Jessica Giffen. She's recently at like 71,000 subscribers or something. Okay, so you guys yeah. are almost gonna get that plaque in the mail soon here once you reach 100K. I'll be, I'll be so happy for her because she's, she's just she's awesome. She, she motivates me and I, she's just so good at her craft. And I can't even tell you like how, you know, you should chase whatever you want to do in life. Cause it's crazy. Like, you now I won't disclose exactly how much money she's making, but she's making way more than she was in, in her profession as being a paralegal and is so much more fulfilled. And like, it's just, it, it's so cool, you know, and doing something you love. So and she's in the home decor niche, right? Yeah. So something about YouTube, I want to talk about it before, but like she, the more you do the same kind of video over and over again, for some reason, the more YouTube loves you mm -hmm. and people will just rewatch the same video over and over again. It's, inter it's interesting to watch. And I don't know. And tell me if you, if you notice this trend after this. Yeah, like no, if, I, I've, I've noticed that too. I figure like if I make a video about dividend investing, I assume my viewers don't want to watch another video about dividend investing, but I've, I've noticed that if I, tend to talk about the same topics, they actually do quite well. So has your wife also found a similar success with that? Yeah. And it's almost where like, if you want to talk about something else, you have to do another channel. <laughs> like, <laughs> and because the algorithm will throttle you and all these things. And not that she does this, she really knows what she's doing and really digs deep into her craft. And, and, and probably like the Achilles heel on my channel <laughs> is that I can't do the same video over and over again. I just, I can't even though now I'm doing it in, in a sense because I really love the topic I'm talking about but like it won't always be this you know so she's really niche down into the core and you just try to make a different mark on kind of redecorating and actually we're talking about buying our next house uh a lot and because of her decorating the house is such a big thing so if we just decorate another house it's really cool there's actually a castle for sale by me um, castle it's a really cool uh, Scottish style castle. And like this, it's really amazing the story behind it. like this homeless guy built it because he needed a house. And it's an amazing house now. I think the question everybody wants to know, Ryan, is, does it have an economic moat around it? <laughs> <laughs> I think the YouTube video, we bought a castle. We got like a million. <laughs> uh, I think, I think, no, I, I'm serious. Uh, it might, you know. I, Right now, I'm not in buying the housing market. The housing is expensive right now. Yeah. And I have to execute the crypto market right now. Like it, it needs, and because I'm actually not sitting on a bunch of cash right now either, because, you know, I, I put my chips out there for, for this play. And uh, so, but I am being forward thinking. I'm thinking about, I will be buying some real estate in the next year. And then also, I, I, you know, I want to really plan for the, you know, the Bitcoin 2024 having, make that a really big move. Because I really feel like, I could retire by 2026 by, by, by having lots of capital to make on that move. Wow. So your fire age 
is you're aiming for 37 best case scenario i think we all can retire that anyone anyone and, and, uh, like you can it's it's so abundantly clear after just staring at this market for for four or five years now like this is this is the move and um you know, and a lot of that comes from me having to take profits from this market cycle and, and, and really looking at the trend line when we bought up against it, when people think, well, eh, crypto's probably not going to work out. Go all in at that time. And not when I say all in, I'm always a bit diversified, but like I've, I've noticed for myself, if I'm high, when my higher conviction plays, if I, if I over allocate, that seems to be the best move. Yeah. And there's a, there's an old Peter Lynch quote you know, talk about diversifying, it can also e equal diversification was the word that he used. But don't get me wrong, like, it comes with its dangers, and you really have to be calculated, and, 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 and you have to accept that you could be wrong and have to deal with that. I'll, I'll tell you this, Ryan, I'm still probably not as bullish on crypto as you, but I think what I'm going to start doing now is every month, I'm just going to dollar cost average into probably the, some of the more mainstream cryptocurrencies. And even even if I'm, even if you're a fraction of how bullish you are on cryptocurrency, that's still a great like long-term outlook. I will still be rewarded heavily with that investment. Sure, but like, again, by the time, if the market cap gets anywhere around $7 trillion, $7 trillion I will have so little cryptocurrency. Like I, I plan to get rid of, like I'm, I'm overly, diversified like I, I have in terms of well I, I sometimes I made a video talking about it once like the Kelly Criterion but like you have to understand like crypto is going to go up and a coin like Ethereum it, it'll drop by at least 80 percent from where it tops so let's say if it goes to 7,000 like it's probably going to go back under 1,000 okay and it's going right. to and it's going to go there for like three years and then it's going to go to like 40,000 Oh, I see. So you're not you're not necessarily trying to like buy and hold. You're trying to kind of you're trying to get in and out. Is that what you're kind of trying to do? Yeah, because it's going to be extremely painful. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> I, I went through 2018, and I and, and I saw, and also I watched 2013. It uh it and it's going to be so painful on the way down for people that are throwing money at it because you're right now buying the dip always works. Yeah, it always works. It always works. But eventually, it, it, buying the dip works until it doesn't. And then what it's going to start doing is it's going to it's going to top, and then it's going to fall thirty percent. Then it's going to go up fifteen. Like oh, it, there's another dip. And where, where's the next one coming? Then it's going to fall further, and then it's going to be a falling night. And um, and it's going to be very painful. And 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 and, and that's why I, I don't think crypto right now, in the terms of the infancy of the market, it's so immature in the way it moves. Mm -hmm. uh, you really have to. Have a really long-term outlook but for me it's like how could i turn down i can't watch let's say if, if the market goes i could have near like a half million dollars in crypto like i can't watch that go back down to fifty thousand. dollars that'd be way too painful for me yeah because um if you know if you don't mind sharing like what's kind of your percent breakdown between like crypto stocks and real estate right now um i'm about all right so i'm, I'm gonna throw numbers at the hip here uh i have roughly three hundred thousand dollars into real estate um, in terms of equity, if I sold, like that would be mine. Yeah. I have roughly, let's say $225,000 in crypto. And then I have another, I would say about that $225,000 in stocks. So. Right. Are you, in. are you a millionaire now? Almost. Almost. Oh, I, you know, I could be, and I actually, I wrote that check to myself, <laughs> but like, it's really hard to value your the value of your business. Like, so I can modestly say like what I think a, a small private business would sell based on earnings. Um, I'm getting dangerously close to that. I, I think I could probably say like I, with a certain level of confidence, but like but my goal, I wrote myself a check to cash July 5th of 2022. I wrote this when my net worth was under a hundred thousand. Um, and I said in five years, I'll be a millionaire. And I, like, I don't want to jinx myself, but like some <laughs> days it gets like, it almost becomes real. Brian, I guarantee you, your YouTube channel is going to blow up the moment that you can start using millionaire reacts, like in all of your titles, <laughs> or a millionaire's opinion on cryptocurrency. Yeah. A millionaire's opinion yeah. on Dogecoin. That's crazy. Yeah, that's uh, those videos do well for Graham. So. <laughs>
So, um, so you and uh, Jessica, are you guys kind of with your friends and family? Are you guys kind of known as like the YouTube couple or the investing, uh, you know, couple power couple there? Uh, yeah, yeah. So some some people, but but not really. Like you know, with COVID, this whole last year, you know, we missed a lot of that. But you know, I'm kind of kind of a small crew too. Like see the same people over and over again, and. Um, but, you know, but some people have been, you know, when you first start crypto and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, when you first start YouTube, I'm kind of public, obviously public about it, like, and, and you, and you keep your privacy. So like everyone around, around me knows I have a YouTube channel and, and some people thought like, oh, he's dumb and this, that, <laughs> and, and it was funny. I was, I was at a wedding like, like a month ago and this one guy's like, man, I thought that was like really lame that you're doing, but then he started buying it. <laughs> oh, <Bitcoin. laughs> he just yeah, yeah. Up, said that to you. <laughs> But he's like, but man, I've been investing in Bitcoin Cash, man. You've made me a bunch of money. <laughs> it's like, I'm a okay. fan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but no, you know, most people, in terms of business, though, it's actually created a lot of friendship and like, you know, more respect in terms of, you know, like I may have some knowledge of value that we can, you know, especially in like the entrepreneur world, you know, the idea of, you know, I think everyone wants to make more money, mm -hmm. but, you know, it's given me a platform that the, the build different term, uh, kinds of friendships or conversations with, with people that I used to maybe look up to more that had like large businesses that, you know, like called me at like lows of the pandemic, like asking my opinions on things, you know? So that was uh, a pretty cool dynamic. Yeah. I love like the community we he have here on our finance uh, YouTube community. It's like in real world, you're not going to be able to just talk to anybody about like, hey, did you hear about Procter and Gamble increasing their dividend by three percent? <laughs> in our small niche, um, like people, they really love to talk about things like that. Like it's you know, it encourages you, it keeps you motivated, uh, and you know, it's it's awesome to reach different financial milestones and you know whatever freedom that brings to each individual person. It, it's just great. I, that's what I love about this YouTube community. Same here, man. And, you know, it's funny you talk about that, like so much of the investing uh, sentiment for the last year has gone into like uh, the EV hype, the SPAC hype, and now the crypto hype. And, um, and if I remember before that, like when PPC Ian started getting big, like the market wasn't as crazy in nature as it is now. And people just really respected the dividend niche a little bit more. And those days will come back. And, uh, and, and, I, and I really try to preach it to a lot of these people that like a lot of investors or these people that I, most people I deal with, they like, want like the, 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 the big ride up. And uh, I, I just think um, that's, that's dangerous. Like, especially if you have a lot of capital too. Like I befriended a lot of people in my neighborhood, you know, like, you know, have more money than me. And uh, people, like, that got, like, people that got big inheritances, like, you know, money that they didn't necessarily work for too. It, yeah um and those people i'm not as close with like I, some of the guys that have some, you know businesses they've done well with i really befriended and they've done some really cool stuff and i'm really talking them into like like dude you got like this you know like millions here like this could be the x amount in dividends a year with like a modest four percent yield and like and, and it's you know when and it's weird like there was this chat going on uh and the, i was saying if you had five million dollars and at a four percent yield you can make 200 grand a year and one of the guys was trying to tell me like, that's not enough money. I'm like, bro, I could live on $30,000 a year in a bungalow in a tree. Like, I can be happy. Like money doesn't necessarily make me happy. The idea of being free is, is what drives me. Yeah. And I'm not sure if we actually talked about what your full-time career, like, I know you do more entrepreneurial stuff, right? With the, you're still doing the ice guys and providing yeah. like, uh, ice to different like restaurants and you always talk about ice. So ice is a division that we, we grew. Okay. Um, so we have three different uh, brands that we provide services to hospitality. So like what's becoming the mothership is uh, the equipment dealership. So we are a restaurant equipment dealership. You want a restaurant, Cody, you come to us, we'll design it, we'll put it in a CAD, we'll do the food mechanical, you know, the, all the equipment mechanicals, so you can give it to your contractor and build you a beautiful restaurant. We'll sell you all the equipment to go in. Now, when you do that and you get this big equipment bill, you like it for like 200,000, you're going to try to economize this. Can I get a used piece here? Can I finance some money here? Can I rent this from you? Yada, yada. So they, they build it down to, you know, 
you know, make a, a smaller investment in terms of something's going to depreciate a lot too. So, uh, so one thing is we, we rent the dishwasher and sell all the chemicals. Mm. And so they, 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 we, they wash their dishes. They use a lot of soap and clean the restaurant and they buy every week. It's great. Yeah. It's every uh, revenue, right? Right now, as we're speaking, dish machine doors are closing <laughs> and we'll be back next week to bring more chemicals. It's, it's a, it's a great business. And, but in return, if their machine breaks, we send out a technician and on Friday night when they're packed and we fix their machine and they're happy. And then the other thing that people don't like to buy and they can get very expensive, especially if you have like a big restaurant and you want like a lavish ice uh, bar business, you want to have big rocks, you want to have nugget cubes, you want to have flakes for your oysters, all this. And you get in the ice world that can turn into something. But, um, you know, people, there was a, there's a big company out there uh, we compete with uh, but they want to rent that too. And it, it's, it's, a, it took, it's taken a lot of cash to build it out. Now the revenue's gotten, you know, pretty good, but like, you know, the break even on the ice machines, like 18 months, if you will. So you're, we're taking a lot of those profits from selling equipment and we're buying the ice machines and building more monthly cash flow. Yeah. So yeah. we have these different cash flow revenue, you know, areas. Um, and you know, between that, we run a nice little business. All right. And that's crazy. You know, like up until you mentioned that, I never really even thought about like the infrastructure like that. Like if you think about it, every, you know, restaurant needs something like what you just described, but people usually don't even think about that yet. It's a very profitable uh, business or industry, as you mentioned, it just kind of reminds me about, you know, I just made a video about Domino's pizza and a lot of people like they just overlook Domino's because, okay, yes, yeah, <laughs> pizza business. Uh, and people are shocked to learn that Domino's Pizza is on par with Amazon and total returns in the stock market since they IPO'd, IPO'd in uh, 2004. So, yeah, I mean, uh, if you guys are going public, let us know and we'd we'll <laughs> love to invest in so, you. Have you ever come across Ecolab? Uh, it sounds uh, very uh, familiar. They're, they're, they're publicly traded. They're a great stock. Bill Gates owns a bunch of, bunch of them. He's one of our biggest competitors in the hygiene world. So the dishwasher, they have a big division and they're, they're the, the big gorilla that we compete with. Um, so so they, they're, they're, they're out there. Equipment dealerships aren't really big. And you know, it's a still very mom and pop type business with the e-commerce thing on it. And then, uh, yeah, it's, who, who knows? You know, we'll see if that, like I think about like what's after I climb like this hill of financial independence, like what's the next hill? Like take a company public or do this yeah. or, you know, uh, I don't know. At the time being, I'm very focused on financial freedom in 2026 when Bitcoin goes crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, anything that we can do to help destroy Bill, Billy Gates, we're all for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, that's too crazy. What, what, did, what did you say in your last video? Oh, about, I made that? the memes about him and his divorce. What, 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 I, tell me the joke again. I, yeah, I can't, it was like him, his wife and uh, Jeff Bezos, his ex-wife, they're like the greatest investors of investors. all time. You know, I just don't understand, you know, like if you are a celebrity and this is for both men, men and women, right? If you have a lot of money, I don't understand why you don't sign a prenup. Like the percent of these marriages working out is so low. I don't know why these people risk all that. Yeah. But like, there, there could be different perceptions of it. Like, and let's say I'm able to gain like a substantial amount of wealth like on a fraction of what these guys can but like my wife was there from when like I was sleeping in a living room you know yeah like how could how does she not deserve half of it you know even if I yeah. like on some level in my opinion that's the way I feel about it yeah I see what you're saying I guess for me it's more like okay like Kim and uh Kim Kardashian Kanye West I think they actually did get a prenup but both of them were very famous very wealthy even before like uh, getting married so like for them it, it, there's it's a no-brainer just to get the prenup yeah. and just to avoid that stuff I actually think Kim Kardashian is probably worth that whole family is probably worth more than Kanye yeah but uh, we, we were both really poor when we started so I think it's fair <laughs> to <laughs> we were equally poor <laughs> <laughs> so Ryan I know um, I know you lived in Florida during this whole pandemic and you know we're not asking for your uh, necessarily political endorsements here but we're just asking about what your thoughts on the current governor of uh, Florida, Ron DeSantis being, he's actually one of the favorites now to be running in 2024. So how do you think he handled the pandemic in Florida? Uh, I wanted to kind of share something else, like a, a goal of mine, like personally, like I talked like this next hill I want to climb in life. And it kind of segues from this because it's a little, it's a pretty political question. And like, 
like I'm actually like I t- touch on like criticizing governments, if you will, in terms of like the pro cryptocurrency and the way they treat uh, stuff like that. And um, so while you know I- I'm very grateful that like he didn't like bankrupt my business because like I had to watch my revenue drop ninety something percent from one week to the next and go a while without any income and you know have to come home and look at my kids every day and figure out like how am I you know like how bad is this going to get and like these people all rely on me like you know very stressful thing so the fact that like he was able to realize us as human beings being able to do things that our free individuals want to do <laughs> um, I think was a very low uh, bar for like a politician to recognize someone's uh, freedoms but I wanted to add that. So like the next goal I really have for myself and I haven't talked about it anywhere. I'll talk about it here first is that like, like a true life goal of mine would be to denounce my citizenship and, and, and no longer pay into the tax system and endorse any of these things any of these people do. So like, like a, so I need to get to a certain level of political, uh, sorry, financial freedom and have to say, I'm willing not to, to walk, I'll walk away from, uh, from social security, Medicare, all these things. I will be sufficient enough for myself. And there's actually movements from the crypto space to buy plots of land from governments that have like, you know, in countries that don't have you know, things there, and actually build new societies on and that are not based on coercion and messing with money supply and allowing people to operate in a voluntaristic way. So it's like a true life goal of mine. So while, while he's a little bit better on some things than a lot of these other ones that were really bad on these things, it doesn't quite get me fired up in terms of just moving away from the political system entirely. Wow, right. I don't think I've ever heard uh, somebody like have that particular stance or that goal in their life. I, uh, I know in the Caribbean, I forget what the actual country is, you can buy like citizenship there for like 250K. Uh, and yeah, that's probably what you were talking about. Like if you, if you have the economic need or means, you can kind of just start a whole new life there and probably try to you know, bring your own philosophy or ideologies there. Yeah, or just or just try something new for civilization to do rather than, uh, you know, and, and maybe my channel will get there. And, uh, and uh, St. Kitts is pretty friendly. And in terms of, if you, you actually have, you just have, you just have to buy a land there with like a heavy fee on top of it, and then you're done. And there's no more taxes after that. And, um, and you're not endorsing a lot of the things that governments do. And, you know, and, and you can, maybe build out societies that really work on cryptocurrency. And, and, and you know, like I, I talked a little bit in one video about being anti-war, not wanting to feel the war machine. And a lot of things that using dollars and paying taxes, you know, do that maybe I don't, I don't like, you know, or, or <laughs> even, if, even if I did like it, why should I take someone else's money that may not like it either? You know, like, why do I have the right to, to do that? Um, yeah, I think I think if most Americans knew what our taxpayer money was actually going to, <laughs> if he is uh, willing to pay taxes. But no, that's uh, yeah, that's, I I love the unique perspective you bring, Ryan. Um, and yeah, you know, definitely, uh, you know, these past couple of years, you know, I've always been uh, you know trying to chase your shadow, and uh, you know, you always inspire me to you know keep working hard in life. And uh, you know, from the outside, you know, it seems like everything's going great for you, but. You know, obviously everything that, you know, we always portray here on YouTube and stuff isn't always, you know, how it is day to day, right? Like, and uh, like you mentioned earlier, like, yeah, I think financially, we probably don't have many problems there, but like other aspects of life, you know, money isn't going to solve those issues. So, uh, so that, yeah, like, like you said, you're still kind of going through that, uh, you know, in the government and uh, it's going to be something. Well, that- it, it, it doesn't haunt me in a way, in a sense. Like, but it's, and, and I may not achieve this goal, but like one of the big reasons to, to want a fire is to have the ability to, to do something like that. And, and I've talked to some other people about it that would be interested in it, but the older people get, they're like, wow, like how much like social security money am, am I willing to give up? Like how much Medicare, like you're, like you're, you're pulled so deep into this. It's like, you know, like it's a very tough decision to make. And, um, and, and maybe I don't do it, you know, but, but that's something that we're, it, it, look, it doesn't necessarily, I'm so grateful for so many things and, and like this would be like a cool frontier where I, I want to just like lead by example example, and show people like we can we can do things different. Like I think it's almost from like a human perspective, like the next step in uh, evolution showing that we can operate in voluntary ways and, uh, and, and not 
you know, you, and again, I don't want to get too deep into all like the specific reasons, but, uh, but there's, I really would like to see peaceful human cooperation in a voluntary way. And, and, um, and I think that would bring out the best in humanity. In my opinion, that could be wrong. And look, we get one life and we can yeah. ch you know, chase our crazy dreams and, 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 and try to do interesting things and maybe fail, maybe do well, who knows? Hey, you know, you know, people, people, when I say that I want to retire by 40, they look at me like I'm crazy. So <laughs> <laughs> extremely grateful for like, Every you know, I'm not saying what I said there to complain per se, but like I'm so grateful. I just feel like there's opportunities in life to 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 leave your mark on it and 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 chase other frontiers. That's what I'm saying. Like, and I think it's like the most actually American thing to do would be to denounce your citizenship because that's how we founded our country. We denounced our citizenship from Great Britain. Uh, so I think it's a very American thing to do. It's actually gotten so popular it used to be free to do, but now it costs almost five thousand dollars per person to denounce. Mm. um because if they can't find enough ways to tax you they will find a way <laughs> uh <laughs> i just yeah. hope i can pay in the cryptocurrency um, yeah no i mean i guess the only reason why i would be somewhat reluctant to do that is obviously like you know there's just so many people in this planet that would like just give anything to be in america right and then uh sure. and I mean, like I, I don't have any kids but you know if i did one day have kids like you know, and I know my parents, like I'm, I'm an immigrant too. Like my parents worked really hard to get here and, you know, I wouldn't want to potentially jeopardize their chances of being able to live in America. But uh, what you're describing is a, a, a totally different type of freedom. Uh, I guess just, it just depends on the perspective. Yeah, it, it's, it's certainly better than most here and we should be grateful for that. But, but we, we shouldn't also just uh, not still try to do better. And uh and like I said, again, this is better than North Korea and Cuba, where my family escaped from. Absolutely. Uh, and, and it's it's better in so many ways. I just think it's, uh, I, I just, and look, and, I, and I, again, I'm grateful for, like, I've had so many fortunate things happen in my life, uh, growing up with a good family, uh, meeting my wife and having my beautiful children. And um, it's just uh, like, that. that's something that is uh, like something I never shared before. When I saw that that question about the Santas, uh, that I wanted to at least share that because, like, I may actually vote for him, and I never really, I never really vote Republican or Democrat, um, but like, and I would be tempted with him, but but a lot of times, and I just can't get jazzed up in the two party system, I guess overall. <laughs> but um, but I am grateful that I was here versus not, and. Um, because I, you know, a lot of people went, went bankrupt and it was, and I know, and I, I felt the worst of the, the, the worst parts of the shutdown because we were shut down for a few months. It was, it was very difficult to survive. Yeah. I mean, it'll just be interesting to see what happens. Obviously, uh, you know, I feel like politics, I feel like it doesn't have that big of an impact on the stock market, but I mean, it's always hyped up in the media that it's, <laughs> this is going to, yeah. you know, destroy the next generation or, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we'll see what happens in 2022, 2024. And, uh, you know, whoever runs, uh, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, obviously, you weren't able to vote in the year 2000, but uh, I'm sure you were, I'm sure you have memories of the 2000. Yeah. Florida. The, hang, the hanging chab. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was, um, yeah, yeah, Florida's, uh, how, how do you guys view Florida? When you're not there, uh, well, these crazy people down here. I feel like there's always Florida man stories. And yeah, yeah, me and my brother, like back when uh, we would always just share Yahoo articles. Back when they reported like actually funny news, would <laughs> like anytime there was a bizarre story, we didn't even have to check. It was always the person was from Florida. <laughs> it was always like <laughs> insane. But yeah, now I think like yeah, there's obviously the Florida stories. Uh, there, I just read this one story that like a mom and her uh, a she had a student that went to school at this particular high school and the two of them like rigged some sort of homecoming election. And now they're both facing like felony charges, like 16 years Ooh, in prison. Yeah. I was like, wow, of course this happened in Florida. <laughs> like, For rigging a homecoming election? Yeah, because her, her mom apparently worked at like the school district and she was able to get into like the school like databases and start changing stuff, which I guess you know, is highly illegal. 16 years in prison is justice? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't <laughs> these laws, man, but yeah, Florida, That's and then true. obviously, yeah, like, obviously, like, tourism, uh, Super Bowl seems to be played there every year, yeah, uh, football, NASCAR is huge there, 
I, I would miss I would miss living in Florida though. I, I have really enjoyed it. it's a beautiful state. Uh, it's in DeSantis has made a very pro business. Uh, real estate does really well down here. Uh, it's it's definitely a great place. And you know, like I said, if I were to announce, um, it it still would take a lot of selling to my wife. You know, so I, I'm not quite there. She's not against the idea, but uh, but she has certain livable needs above mine that I need to be happy. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll add that. Uh, one of my life goals too is also to become a snowbird because, you know, these Midwest winters are slowly killing me. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm still looking at like where that place might be. I've heard good things about Florida, about Arizona. Could also do like, if you live like six months in one day in like Florida, I think you become like a Florida resident and you don't have to pay like the income taxes, at least for part of the year. So it might be something I want to do later. Yeah. On. I don't get like, where does that state income tax go for you guys? Like we still have like municipalities and roads and like. It, <laughs> it goes straight into the politician's pocket. <laughs> nah, I mean, that's a good question. I know here we have a huge like pension crisis. So like they give too much guaranteed money to like uh, <laughs> public officials and uh, people that work for the state. So I think, yeah, pensions are probably outdated nowadays when people are living a lot longer than they did back from back in the day. Just, just build yourself enough dividends. <laughs> but I'm, that's what I'm trying to do, man. Like, I feel like the first time I learned about what dividends were, like a huge just light bulb went off in my head. I was like, so if I just start collecting enough of these shares, never have to clock into work again. <laughs> it, it, it is amazing. I remember like trying to figure out how to get yield from like a CD or a high interest checking account. It's like, I'm getting like nothing. And then like, Remember the first one I saw was like AT&T, like everyone can understand AT&T, he's got to pay that bill every month, like 7%, like that's insane. Uh, like of course, you learn there's a lot more to it, uh, but yeah, a, a dividend is uh, an awesome thing. And something uh, real quick, you know, I'm probably going to wrap up soon, but uh, Blood Phantom 81 brought up something I found pretty interesting, and if you can do it in some great companies, is that what's maybe actually even better than a dividend is uh, is selling a covered call because uh, when 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 money is distributed from the company, that is lost value, you know. Yeah. So so you could, but when you sell a call, you still drip money out of the asset. But the if it's if it's not paying a dividend, they can still grow it. You know. What do you think about that? They can grow it faster, at least I should say. Yeah, I feel like it's kind of what you're talking about. Is that somewhat similar to the irrelevant dividend theory, or is this is like something totally? different no I, I i'm a big believer in dividends and, I, okay. and I, like that but like i just like i i try like my goal now like in great companies it's very difficult right now i'm doing it in like not so good companies but like with SPACs crashing like i bought like 100 shares of like tattoo chef hylion uh what, what uh ipo yeah bfi palantir yeah and companies that i think like could like you know you know bump up but you know, and, and selling calls on them and like further not getting greedy with it not trying to sell too close to the money right um but like if you could do that with like facebook or like tesla and you know like like big companies like that imagine like amazon stock splitting and then doing that with amazon like that'd be amazing yeah that's definitely an intriguing option i just know like you know there's these companies like google uh apple google, that, yeah. that just have so much money on their books right like that's just kind of sitting there feel like at some point like these companies should just reward shareholders and just give even a fraction of it out to investors but i guess they're just <laughs> just waiting for the next opportunity and that's how they get so big you know <laughs> google apple um but yeah no i mean blood blood alex blood phantom 81 yeah i gotta have him on the next uh collect cash podcast uh he's only a few years older than me i think he's one or two years older than me and his portfolio is at like almost four hundred thousand dollars so that guy is definitely going to reach fire at like a very young <laughs> <laughs> that's, what's, that's what's awesome man is meeting you guys and uh and also like you, you guys are so much smarter than i was at your ages like uh, like i like i don't envy it in a way but i admire it for sure like i, I just my, my i was so much more lost than, than you guys are yeah, I mean, hey, we learned from the best like you. And I think when I, mean, I feel like I learned everything I know from YouTube, like even though I went to college for like a business related degree, it's it was all from like YouTube. So I don't know. If yeah. you, I feel like the finance YouTube niche really didn't start emerging until like 2016 for the most part. Who, who brought you in? 
so i think some of the first ones i saw were like ryan scribner uh some of the early nate o'brien you know did you know nate o'brien's actually even younger than i am i don't know (laughs) you don't know nate o'brien i i I feel like i should i i guarantee if you saw his face because he he always has like his face in the thumbnails he probably has like probably like half a million subs uh oh really yeah he he, i'm gonna gonna look him up yeah no he's pretty big in this he's kind of like with the grams stefan's financial education jeremy and you know andre uh but yeah no i'd say like the first people i saw were like graham stefan i saw his video like how he became a millionaire at the age of 26 through real estate so that one kind of got me pretty inspired uh yeah i used to watch like ryan scribner because a lot of his earlier content was like just kind of the basics of investing so i feel like he's he's kind of fallen off a little bit would you say yeah you know he actually moved to miami florida to to avoid those new york taxes oh wow you know i think he was actually from where i went to college too in new york yeah he's from upstate yeah but no I, i still watch his content from time to time it's just on some it's not necessarily more like tutorial content anymore it's more like you know probably like uh intermediate what was trending yeah (laughs) no but i mean it's a great community and lots of different people to learn from here anything else you want to talk about ryan oh man i i I hope i didn't drop too much of a bomb and seem too much like an outlier for certain people uh if if i do i don't mean offense to anyone i i I just think people should uh, consider new ideas and challenge perspectives and and just um you know i i I try to you know like bang against the walls of what is conformed i've I've always kind of at least since like high school like that early age like i wanted to find ways to challenge the status quo and uh i think that's what makes life interesting to me and uh and i'm not always right in in the way i i say and do things but uh but yeah i I really enjoyed having having me on cody and uh, I look forward to, uh, to to continuing, you know, growing our channels. And, and uh, you know, if you ever come down to Florida, you got a place to stay. <laughs> Maybe yeah, we can yeah. uh, observe some Florida man crazy stories or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that'd be great, Brian. I really do appreciate you being on here. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll have you again on here as well. Hopefully it's not just a one-time thing. <laughs>